No, it's very good to see you. And my 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 normal um, view of you was uh, in the past was I was right near the front of the House of Lords, as the bishops were very exposed, and you were sort of hiding a little way back on the middle of the government benches. Is that where you still sit? I've moved forward a few rows, um, having been there for. Oh, 10 years now. But um, I think when you start, it's best to sort of skulk around um, at, at, at the back. Um, uh, and anyway, we, from there, you had a very good view of the bishop's bench. Exactly, yes. And the, the, the person I used to uh, always enjoy coming in was Lord Campbell of... Like, where was he of? He was very, very, very ancient. And he had a stick. And it was almost a, we, a daily thing. You'd come in put his stick down and you knew within seconds it would drop on the floor so everyone jumped <laughs> and then then the next thing was he'd start adjusting his hearing aid so you'd have the wee noises going you know anyway you it's not changed much since you were there <laughs> <laughs> um you, you you've uh, spent quite a lot of your time in um, in the county of essex and um is that where you were uh, you were at school in essex a brentwood school so did you live near there? Yes, I was actually born, well, I'm a twin, so my brother and I were born in Chelmsford Hospital um, and then grew up in Brentwood. My father um, ran a shoe shop in Upminster and um, Brentwood was a handy place to live. Um, so I went to school there and then um, eventually became a local councillor there and so forth. Um, and lived there until the early 1990s. So it's a town I know very well. And I still go back because I'm now lucky enough to be a governor of, of Brentwood School, my old school. All oh, right, yes. And then you went on, you stayed in East Anglia uh, to go to university in the marshes. Um, you were at Peterhouse, is that it? Indeed. And, and I saw your excellent interview with Christopher Lloyd a few weeks ago. And he and I share a number of things in common because we were both taught by the same man, Morris Cowling. Um, and yes, I was at Peterhouse and did history there for three years. And um, uh, um, uh, it was terrific. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's had a great reputation and uh, history is a very good um, place to start. I always think history or English are good starting to be. The other day, someone said to me, what did I do originally? So I said, well, physics really and I had to wait for two or three minutes while they recovered <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't I think I would have done that you know I slightly um, did ended up doing history a bit by accident because I was really a classicist um uh, uh, and so I did latin and greek and um history at uh, uh, a level uh but my wonderful tutor who's still alive and I'm still um, uh, conversing with him, he lives out in Venice, um, uh, uh, was a devout uh, Oxford man and he wouldn't contemplate people going to Cambridge and when he said to me um, uh, which college do you want to go to and I mentioned the name of a college in Cambridge I thought he was going to um, keel over and he said, well, that's, you know, I can't possibly teach you if you're going to go to Cambridge because the classics course there is awful. So I said, well, I really want to go to Cambridge because um, it's a town I've loved since my parents first took me there as a child. So I'll have to do history instead. <laughs> so I'm an accidental historian. That's really good. Uh, I, my, my, my chaplain for three and a half years um, is a great Cambridge man. So I did my first degree in London, but I then went on to do my research degree in Oxford. So we spend all of our time, you know, needling each other. <laughs> After he'd left working for me, he came back to give me a present. It was in a sort of brown paper package. And he said to me, this is the most painful gift I've ever bought anyone. So I wonder whatever it could be. And he, as I opened it up, it was a lovely sort of photo montage come drawing of Trinity College, Oxford. He clearly it had gone against his nature to have to buy this. <laughs> anyway, yeah. we, did you get into politics at school? Uh, yes. Um, uh, and I think that's where my political instincts probably came from. Um, 
And there's one good reason for that uh, is that when I went to Brentwood School, it was a direct grant school. The old direct grant scheme was a, you know, it was a fantastic uh, thing for people like me, but my parents couldn't afford to send me there. And there was um, a, 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 um, a, a grant to help that. But while I was there, it was when the Labour government of the late 1970s was abolishing the direct grant scheme. So in fact, my school had to become an independent school. And if you are, what would I have been, 15 or something like that, and the government is trying actually to abolish the school you're going to and that you love, it sort of politicizes you um, a, a, a bit. And that's, so that's where I think I first got a taste for politics. And um, also I had a teacher, a very good teacher, who encouraged me to go into, do a bit of public speaking. So I used to get involved in some of the debates at the school. Um, uh, and um, then that carried on when I went to Cambridge. Yeah, it's interesting uh, taking us back to that business of the abolition of the direct grant school, um, because I'd been a pretty, uh, you, I'd be a pretty hopeless candidate for you because I fluctuated in how I voted, although I came from a good, good uh, conservative family, you know, Ian McLeod was our MP. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, but um, having said that, I mean, so I, I really enjoy politics. And I could never quite understand why, of all things to have decided to get rid of, it was the direct grant schools, because for the very reason you've explained yourself. It enabled you to go to a very good school when your parents wouldn't afford it. I mean, I think it was just an ideological, it was an ideological totem uh, of that particular government, which was having a very difficult time um, on the economic front. And as so often happens on these occasions, governments need to throw things to their backbenchers to keep them quiet. And uh, uh, the direct grant scheme was one of them. And that was going to be much less uh, tricky than trying to get rid of all private education, I suppose. Yes, which is would be an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. It would, yeah, yeah. OK, so um, when you left Cambridge, what was the first thing you went to do? What was your first job? Well, I actually went into banking for a year um, and joined Barclays Merchant Bank. Um, it was the time of the Big Bang, so it then quickly became Barclays de Zoot Wed. Um, and I did that for a year. And I have to tell you, I didn't enjoy it. And I'm not cut out to be a banker. Um, uh, but during the course of that year, I, which was 1986, I had a letter from Morris Cowling, who is the sort of deus ex machina in my life, saying uh, a friend of mine at the Conservative Research Department is recruiting and I've suggested uh, your name. You probably won't be in the slightest bit interested, but if you are, please give him a ring on this number. Um, and I did and um, went to the Conservative, work in the Conservative Research Department at the back end of 1986, just before a general election. Uh, since then, I've never been back into banking. And I think I'm- Some I'm of my best not. friends are bankers, I should say that. Yeah, I don't yeah, have yeah. anything against it, but it, it, it just didn't work for me. <laughs> yes, because it, I think bankers are now a bit more sort of uh, touchy about anyone's making comment because of what's happened, of course, whatever it was 15 years ago. Um, so, but I, am I right in thinking that both Enoch Powell and, Maura, uh, and uh, Ian McLeod um, were both also in the Conservative Research Department at one point. Uh, yes, that's right. I think Enoch Powell was the one who rejuvenated it in the 1950s. Um, yeah. Because the Conservative Party after the 1945 election went into a period of some decay and needed ideological change. And Powell was one of the ones that did that. It's interesting, isn't it? Because in a way, uh, the other interesting thing is that both Powell and um, McLeod were the two people who resigned with the um, appointment of Alec Douglas Hume as leader and thus prime minister. And yet, in some ways, you'd see them from rather different ends of the conservative spectrum. Polar opposites, indeed. Yeah. And yet on that thing, I, I wonder why they were together. I, I suppose it may be the process that annoyed them. Politics makes some strange bedfellows from time to time. Yeah. People never, I don't, I'm not sure people really always understand that, but some of my 
best friends in the Lords are on the Labour benches. Um, in fact, I think, was it McLeod who, um, or Macmillan who said that in politics, um, you, you look at your opponents, but actually your real enemies are the ones who are sitting behind you. <laughs> and there's some truth in that. Yes, I can see, I can see that. And actually, one of the things I found really encouraging in my time uh, in the House of Lords was, that, was the way in which there was so much commerce, uh, not universally, but quite a lot of commerce across the, uh, the divisions within the House, which was, I think, um, encouraging. And it was much less scrappy than you, some of the debates in the House of Commons. So uh, how long were you at the research department for then? Um, I was there for three years, and during the course of that time, I met a man who has been very important in my life, and that was John Wakeham, um, who was then Mrs Thatcher's chief whip. And um, I used to have a role um, uh, briefing her during the, the general election campaign, and John Wakeham would come out um, when I was waiting to go in to do this every morning and give me some tips as to sort of what mood she was in and what I should say. And he would occasionally say something like, the atmosphere in there is rather tense. Can you try and make her laugh? Um, and on occasion, I sort of succeeded in doing that. But we got to know each other quite well then. And um, when he became energy secretary, he asked me to go and be his special advisor. Um, so I've had dealings with him there and then subsequently at the Press Complaints Commission. And as I say, he's been a very, very important figure in my life. He's a very nice man, isn't he? Very nice man. And had, had of course, his own tragedy with the uh, Brighton bombing and so on. Indeed. Yeah. So, yes, and that's, that's another area where um, not exactly our paths have crossed, but um, certainly our interests have crossed because I was for... Um, 10 years, I suppose, a trustee of a thing called the Media Standards Trust. And yes. Our declared aim was to try and improve um, the standard of British journalism. Um, but of course, some thought um, that we were there simply to try and curtail press freedom, which I think none of us would want. And anyway, quite a few were journalists anyway. Um, but the Daily Mail did spend seven pages on one occasion, a special edition trying to uh, get rid of us. So tell us about the Press Complaints Commission. So the Press Complaints Commission, um, subsequent history um, uh, has been difficult for it. But actually when it was set up, it was set up with a very straightforward aim, which was to oversee a code and to deal with complaints for members of the public. Um, the Press Council, which had preceded it, had gone badly wrong in that in that basic mission of trying to get people um, uh, some form of redress uh, when a story had been accurate or there had been intrusion to privacy or something. And the PCC was set up with a, that very specific role of looking after members of the public. And I think it did a very good job. Um, uh, it dealt with many thousands of complaints. It dealt with them swiftly, which is what needs to happen. It, did, it dealt with them without any cost to the public or to the taxpayer because the newspaper industry um, picked up the bill. And um, I think we had, during the course of the, the time that I was there, a number of very distinguished people, it, both editors and lay people who were in the majority, uh, who ran the organisation. So, uh, I, you know, I'm a, I will always be a defender of the work that the PCC did. Uh, there were a lot of institutions which came crumbling down at the time of the phone hacking um, uh, uh, scandal, and the PCC was one of them. But as I say, uh, for the job that it did there, I, I think it, um, I think it deserves credit. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that was a, a, a grim period, it wasn't it? The phone hacking yeah. episode. Yeah. Um, much well, anybody, any, anyone involved in newspapers um, and who loves newspapers and publishing, even if you were absolutely nothing to do with it, it, it was a grim period because it, I think it tainted the whole industry. Yes, absolutely. And do you, do you think it, has it um, been now cleansed from that period or do you think there are still lingering 
uncertainties. On the specific issue of phone hacking? No, I mean on how the, the press being responsible, as it were. Yes, I think the world has moved on. I mean, if anything, I actually think there is an argument that people were so cowed by the Leveson process that um, newspapers are not quite as fearless as they sometimes used to be. Um, uh, uh, but as I said, the world has moved on. The, the threats now um, come from the, the platforms from Google and Facebook who are taking advertising from traditional publishers and causing immense economic damage, particularly to the regional press. And I think that's where the debate and the argument is now. If there's a, uh, if there's a threat to press freedom, it comes from the, the commercial side rather than the, the direct threat of government intervention. Yes, that's interesting. I think that, and it's, I find it quite depressing that the, um, the, the local press has suffered so badly. It's interesting. The, the chair of the um, Media Standards Trust was uh, David Bell. And David, I remember saying quite early on, I started off, he said, um, with the Oxford Mail going down at least once a week to the local court to listen to uh, trials going on and so on and reporting on that. Um, the newspaper here now, I don't think has any reporter. And I write an article for them once a month. And I didn't even imagine that they'd pay me for it. Well, they don't, but uh, they couldn't afford to do so. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, because I, when I was growing up and had an interest in local politics, reading the Brentwood Gazette was absolutely essential. And it came out on a Thursday. You'd go down to the news agents and you'd find people actually queuing up to buy a copy of it. And it was a, you know, it was a substantial publication. Um, it's still going, but like many local newspapers, a, a, a sort of a shadow of its former, uh, former self. But that's one of the sort of real problems in our democracy now, that those local newspapers were so important in scrutinising and holding local politicians to account, health authorities to account, all the rest of it. And now it, it's just so difficult to do that. And do you see any way of resolving um, the impact of social media um, in this area so that there is actually a, a greater sense of equality in terms of what we hear and what we say? And well, there is hope on the uh, in the area of the sort of commercial life and side of um, uh, the local press, as well as the, the national press. The Competition and Markets Authority brought out a report um, uh, uh, last year, which the government is going to put into legislation in due course, which will go some way to writing the commercial imbalance between Google and Facebook taking all our content. Um, uh, as well as the advertising which pays for it. So uh, there's going to be change coming there. Um, uh, and I, you know, I think that, that that's going to be one of the big things that could turn it around for the, for the local press in particular. Well, that, that's, that, that, that's, that's some encouragement anyway. Now, I noticed a couple of other things, just looking through your uh, background, that seemed interesting. You were um, part of the Edward Heath charitable trust. A friend of mine was actually on the trust that runs the, the house down in Salisbury, but they're independent, are they, of each other? Uh, no, it's the same trust. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I can't think what the house, what the place is called. Lord Lexton, does he? Arundel's. Arundel's. Arundel, Arundel, yes, Arundel. Yes. Um, yes, but uh, yeah, a very good friend of ours is, um, uh, whose name is David Woodhead, and he has the wonderful uh, email address of the Timber Tops. I like that. It's a good, uh, good address, isn't it? For a man called Woodhead. Is that um, David Woodhead who used to run the Independent Schools Council? That's right, yes. Yes, you know, yes, no, I knew him many years ago. Oh, well, I'll tell him we've been uh, having this conversation. Very good man. Um, Is he a member of our company? I, I can't remember. No, he's not. Is there a way he could be? I'm sure we'd find a way around, wouldn't we? Sure. Yes, I'm sure there we, are yeah, always right. ways. Yes, exactly. And um, and then also the Imperial War Museum. Were you were a trustee, or 
Yes, and actually it was it was the first public appointment I ever applied for because when I was in politics, you couldn't really do public appointments. Well, certainly not back then. Um, and after I went to the Telegraph, um, I saw a position for a trustee advertised. And um, I've always been fascinated in, uh, in, in 20th century history. And I thought, hmm, I should do this. And then it was during the course of that year that my uh, father died. And he had he had fought in the war. Um, he'd been at the, the um, beachhead in Anzio, and I thought he'd probably be quite proud if I was to do this. So I applied, not in the expectation that I'd get the role, but then for some reason they appointed me, and it was fantastic because I learned so much about being a trustee and charity governance and so forth from being part of a big distinguished um, board. So I was, I was hugely um, relieved that I put in the application in the first place. It's a marvelous museum, isn't it, still? It is. Yeah, and museums have come on so much. I can remember when I was a lad going to Verulanium, the St. Albans Roman Museum, and it really did consist of lots of glass cabinets with pieces of broken pottery in it. But when you go in now, you really do get taken back into the culture and life of what it's representing, I think. Well, one of the things that um, I was very proud to be a part of was the um, campaign to raise money to redo all the um, First World War galleries in time for the commemoration of the outbreak of the war in, in 2014. And actually those galleries hadn't changed since I was a child. I mean, as you say, they were big glass cabinets, shoved full of things, which you didn't have a clue what they were. There was absolutely no ability to sort of use digital technology to find out about them and so forth. And we raised, um, we raised all the money to do it just in time. And it was one of the scariest fundraising campaigns I've ever been involved in, because of most fundraising campaigns, probably even like our own fundraising campaign um, at, at stations. If you can't get all the money together uh, um, in time, you can actually just put the building work back a little bit. What we couldn't do was change the um, 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War, a date which was set in stone. So it was quite hair-raising. Exactly, you had no choice. And it's wonderful now you go in there and you feel you're about to be attacked by aeroplanes. Yeah, yeah. hanging above you and so on. Yeah. Now, I'll, I would never be forgiven if I didn't move us on to, to, to spend a moment or two on the stationers. Well, when did you become a stationer? Uh, I think it was 2016. And who, uh, who in, encouraged you? Well, you know, it's a funny thing that I'm not quite sure I can remember. Uh, that's partly because the two great Fleet Street institutions of, uh, of stationers and some brides seem to have been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. Because I, when I went to the Press Complaints Commission, which is just off Fleet Street in the late 90s, I started being invited along to events at stationers from time to time by people, um, and went to services at St Bride's and started getting involved in the work of St Bride's. So I've almost over a quarter of a century grown up with both these um, uh, institutions. I suspect um, that it might have been the great William Alden who invited me along to a lunch and said, you really should think about becoming a stationer at some point. Um, and I knew so many people there, including uh, my dear friend, Simon Heffer, who you um, interviewed a few weeks back. And so I, I, I didn't need much persuasion. No, William William was, is an amazing character, isn't he? And, uh... You know, we've been jolly lucky to have William and now, now Giles. And of course, the, the two of them were in school together for a while, of course. Um, so, which, I mean, I suppose I always want to say to people, is there any particular part of the station as work or that you'd like to see prosper more or, yes, but get more, us get more involved in or? Well, I'd like to get more involved in the work of stationers in time. Um, it's sometimes a bit difficult with a, a, a busy day job uh, to do all the things that I'd like to do but I've been very uh, pleased to get involved in the Shine Awards for instance 
and also the Crown Woods Academy. Um, I've been over there a couple of times and done a couple of the speech days um, and enjoyed coming along to dinners when I can. Um, I think we have a, a massive role to play in the industry uh, because all the debates that we're going to be having going forward, we were talking about just now about the platforms and um, uh, how content can be paid for, all come down to copyright. Um, uh, and that's an area where we have huge authority. And I must just say that the other uh, big thing that I always loved about stationism, but been able to get involved in, of course, is music. Um, and having St. Cecilia up there next door to Caxton and the windows combines uh, uh, you know, a couple of my passions in life. And um, uh, the, the Hanover Band has been there a number of times, and um, uh, which I was chairman of a few years ago. And being involved in music at Stationers, I think has been wonderful. I think we should, if we can, do more of that. And I think one of the great things, you know, even halfway through sort of, sort of semi-lockdown was the recording of those eight Beethoven symphonies by the Hanover yes, Band. Indeed. It, it made my week. I used to look forward to, you know, you, you, you just wanted something to break up the, how it, how it all felt. Well, but I became chairman of the Hanover Band, sorry, just in very brief parenthesis, having um, heard them first at Stationers and was sat next to the Caroline Brown, the founder of the band. And she said, I think you should become a bit more involved in all this. That, that's what seems to always happen to me when I go to stations. Well, that's partly what we're there for, I think. Anyway, I think the great thing about today is it made me realise I should have spent a bit more time when I was sitting uh, rather in front of you in the, uh, of the, uh, in the House of Lords to try and actually have a conversation. I hope perhaps when now we're being opened up, hopefully a bit more, uh, we might have an opportunity to do that. And talk a bit longer. These things always run out far too quickly. Thank you ever so much anyway. Thank you.